Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Peter Holland. I'm the Associate Dean for the Arts, and it is my pleasure every year to be the person who organizes and introduces the speakers uh, for Saturday Scholars, except because I was on leave, research leave last semester, I didn't make the choices for this one. Uh, I have no objections about any of them, but especially not that I'm able to introduce Jason Ruiz today. Now, some of you who looked very carefully at the information will recognize that there is a gap between this title and the title that was being announced. Don't worry, there is a connection, uh, but, but Jason tells me that this is a project he has now begun work on, it's very much new work, and he very much wanted to try it out, oh, audience of guinea pigs, uh, and to see what happens. So Jason Ruiz uh, joined Notre Dame uh, straight, more or less straight from graduate school, which he was an undergraduate and graduate student at the University of Minnesota, uh, and came to Notre Dame in 2008, uh, was tenured in 2015, uh, and amongst the signs of somebody who's really rather successful. Uh, he was a recipient this last uh, summer of an Edmund P. Joyce Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching at Notre Dame, the university's highest single honor uh, for teaching. And his publications include his first book, uh, Americans in the Treasure House, Travel to Porphyrian Mexico and the Cultural Politics of Empire published by the University of Texas Press in 2014, and I, did, I realized out in paperback as well. Uh, he's published in a wide range of journals in, in American studies, from Radical History Review and American Studies to the Journal of Transnational American Studies and Oral History Review. Uh, he's been a, a, a co-editor of special issues of these journals, uh, and he's also provided written commentary, op-ed pieces and the like for the New York Times, Flow TV, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and other media outlets. He is, in other words, a high success, and we're delighted to have him here at Notre Dame. Let me ask you to welcome Jason Ruiz. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Holland, for that introduction and for curating this great uh, series. I apologize that, Peter Ho or that uh, Jim Collins invited me without you, but uh, I hope that you don't mind after hearing this. I also want to thank Ann Knoll and Bridget Hoyt from this night for helping me pull the technology together for this talk. Uh, there, as you'll see, there's some media clips, which also always makes me nervous and keeps me up at night. So it was great knowing this week that it would work out. And I'm really honored to be, have the opportunity to share, as Peter mentioned, some very brand new research that I'm doing uh, for a new book project. And I'm especially excited to share these ideas with a Notre Dame game day crowd. So as Peter mentioned, way back in the spring, I was having commitment issues with the title for this talk. So I confess that I was somewhat vague about discussing Latinos on television. That might have been what got you here. Uh, you might have seen that on the website or in flyers for, or posters for the event. But I'm really proud to say that this represents some intellectual growth in how I'm thinking about the project. I've focused in on a particular topic that I want to zoom in on in this book project and that I want to talk about today, specifically Latinos and the drug trade and the drugs and the narcotic trade. As a scholar of American studies with a lifelong passion for pop culture and history, I can tell you that drugs have been a key theme in US popular culture for centuries, depicted in a variety of media from stage melodramas and dime novels in the 19th century uh, to blockbuster movies and primetime TV today. So throughout this history of representing drugs, the themes associated in popular culture with drugs have been remarkably consistent over this long history, namely that drugs pose a danger and a threat to both the individual and to the nation. Importantly, for the purposes of this talk, representations of drug and drug use also have been tied to representations of racialized others in America. Whether depictions of the Chinese opium den in the 19th century and in more contemporary recent television, such as in The Nick, I don't know if anybody has been watching The Nick on Cinemax, 
Uh, television series uh, have often, or uh, popular culture in general has often associated these racialized groups with the threats that drugs pose to the nation. This is even true for more contemporary fare, like a show like The Wire that is famous for having a very progressive view of drug policy in the United States. U.S. popular culture has long suggested that people of color and drugs go hand in hand. And more specifically, that non-white people pose a threat to the dominant culture in part because they are so closely associated with the using, selling, and trafficking of drugs. A clear and rather poignant illustration of the fact that drugs are racialized in America is, of course, the overrepresentation of non-white people sitting in U.S. prisons for drug, nonviolent drug offenses right now. And I could go on and on about statistics. I'm happy to talk through these in the Q&A. But I have some backup here to talk about the fact that drugs, as this sort of, this is a pullout of this. You can see these are people in federal prisons in the United States. You can see among that population of the imprisoned in America, about half of the people imprisoned in the federal system are there for nonviolent drug offenses. And of course, I have lots of statistics to show, and I can refer to them a little bit later if you're interested. I can refer to the fact that uh, many of those people are uh, for people of color who are overrepresented in that system. I'll actually settle on just showing you a couple of very sad statistics that I think really illustrate this point. The fact that black men in America have a one in three chance of lifetime imprisonment in the United States. The number for Latinos is not quite as dire, but is also should be shocking and horrifying if, like me, uh, you're interested in Latino studies. One in six Latino men and one in 45 Latinas will face prison time during their lifetimes. So what do we do with these shocking statistics? How do we possibly make sense of the fact that Latinos are so overrepresented when it comes to nonviolent drug imprisonment? I also have to say that according to the US government, according to the DEA, according to many federal and academic sources, Latinos use drugs at a lower rate than the general population of the United States. So how do we make sense of this discrepancy? How do we wrap our heads around the fact that Latinos are less likely than the general population to use drugs in America? but way more likely to be imprisoned for nonviolent drug offenses in America. I'm actually going to take you to a place that might not be the first thing you think about, which is popular culture. Because what I really am dedicated to studying and asking is what role does popular culture play in helping to frame these statistics? If we have this problem in America of imprisoning non-white people for drug offenses, when they are very often the least likely to use drugs, what role does popular culture play in framing this social problem, and in actually, I would argue, perpetuating this problem. This afternoon, I want to explore why these discrepancies exist, and I want to posit that we might turn to popular culture as one potential explanation to talk about mass incarceration. I argue that we must pay close attention to popular culture as the cultural wing of the policies and policing practices that lead to these disparities. Simply put, I want to ask if we can attribute them in some part to the representational practices that continuously link racial difference to the nation's drug problems. In particular, I will ask, what kind of cultural work does representations of Latinos and drugs perform? And how does this cultural work relate to some of the bigger questions and problems in the fields of Latino studies and American studies, my overlapping fields that I work in? Some of these problems are mass incarceration, the ongoing construction of Latino bodies and communities as intrinsically alien to the US body politic and intrinsically criminal, and the failings of the war on drugs. So in the talk, I'm going to turn to, as you saw in the title, this new phrase that I'm working with called narco-media. I want to use this word to refer to the various cultural forms that position Latinos and Latinas as inextricably tied to drug economies. Anthropologist Paul Ice has used this term, uh, narco-media, actually to refer to the, the types of messages that narco-traffickers have left each other. So there's famous instances, Mexico is a real hotbed of narco-trafficking right now. Uh, sometimes, uh, and you'll see this if you watch narcos, you'll see messages scrawled on dead bodies, you'll see messages written for, from one cartel to a rival cartel. He uses that phrase, to uh, he uses narco-media to describe those modes of communication. But what I want to do is take ICE's theory of narcomedia and expand it to talk about this whole constellation of images that are, circulate again and again in popular culture and have for a very long time that associate Latinos as a particular uh, 
as a particular racialized ethnic group that is associated very closely and I would argue unfairly with the drug economy. Although narcomedia takes many forms, I am most interested right now in how films and television have narrated the war on drugs and America's vision as both its Latino, uh, of both its Latino populations and its relationship to America. The, excuse me, the relationship of those Latino populations of Amer the, to the general population of America. So I have to go a little bit back in time to begin because I would say that one of the er texts of this brand of popular culture that I am talking about would have to be this film, Scarface, which premiered in 1983. Any Scarface fans in the room? So, oh, I see a, cu a couple will admit to it. A fan, really? Okay, we'll talk. <laughs> Scarface serves as a logical starting point for my investigation of narcomedia for many reasons, and I'll only mention a few of them right now. I want to especially zoom in on where America is with the question of drugs and the drug trade in 1983 when the film appears. I, of course, have to mention, however, first, that Scarface from 83 is a remake of the 1932 film. That, any fans of that film? Okay, the alumni don't go back that far. Okay, so a, a couple. Um, the 19th, I actually watched this over and over again a couple weekends ago, and I have to say the 1932 Scarface is a really good movie. I highly recommend it. I find this Scarface kind of unwatchable. That's another story. The 1932 Scarface, however, is really brilliant, and it stars, in, very interestingly, Paul Mooney as an Italian immigrant who rises and falls as a bootlegger, another illegal substance in the 1930s when the film takes place. And the 1980 three version, uh, there's Paul Mooney with his sister, <laughs> obviously. Um, the 1983 version is a remake that actually stays pretty faithful to that film. The updated version was only a minor hit in 83, but it has real staying power in popular culture as a symbol of Latinos and the drug trade. Of course, there's this iconic moment in film history, say hello to my little friend, I won't bore you with the accent, but one of the things that really fascinates me is the fact that Scarface, a minor film in 83, sort of interpreted by the New York Times and other critics as a, as a B-movie, as a ready-made B-movie, kind of cheesy in my opinion, sorry Pam, uh, but it does have real staying power. In the United States, you can see you can play Scarface, The World is Yours, which is actually a popular role-playing game. There's a, a rap hip-hop artist named Scarface and, uh, as an homage to the movie, and there's lots of other iterations of Scarface. Beyond just its ubiquity as an image of the Latino drug trade that has been repeated and appropriated ad nauseum in popular culture, there are two reasons beyond the staying power that I just mentioned that it makes sense to use Scarface as, my, as the starting point, this Scarface, as the starting point in my investigation of narcomedia. Well, first, so two reasons why I start with this film. Although it appeared 12 years after President Richard Nixon declared war on drugs, Universal Pictures released Scarface at a very pivotal moment in the drug war's history. Within a year or before, after it, before or after its premiere on December 1st, 1983, a lot is happening in America with drugs, especially the influx of cocaine into the United States. So, in 1982, the DEA makes the largest drug bust in US history. I wonder if anyone remembers this, actually. 1982, Miami International Airport, the uh, DEA busts uh, 4,000 pounds of Colombian cocaine worth almost $100 million wholesale at MIA. Also, within a year or after Scarface's premiere, a Miami grand jury indicted Pablo Escobar and others involved with the Medellin cartel, leading to about a decade of tension between, US and Colum between the United States and Colombia over extradition policies. Also, as a child of the 80s, I have to point out, about four months after the premiere of Scarface, this lady, Nancy Reagan, uh, introduces the Just Say No campaign that for me and for others like me who are turning 40 this year, uh, the Just Say No campaign was very fundamental in shaping our vision of drugs in the 1980s. That's, she's the reason why I just said no most of my life. Um, <laughs> Perhaps just as significantly after 1983, this text appears on US uh, television in 1984 and lasts six seasons, surprisingly, lasts six seasons as a major network hit and made some uh, TV stars. 
In the time period around 83, the influx of cocaine had caused so much cultural anxiety that Time Magazine even asked this question about South Florida on the cover of its magazine. They saw South Florida, Miami, which had the highest murder rate in the United States in the early 80s. They saw South Florida as, question mark, paradise lost. This is only, of course, to mention what's happening in the United States during this period. The history of the drug trade shows that Mexico, Panama, Nicaragua, and Colombia were all experiencing massive political and social turmoil as the global cocaine trade heated up in this period. So Scarface, the movie, didn't cause any of this, of course. But I will argue that Scarface taps in to these cultural anxieties that are taking place in the United States that are specifically focused in Miami and South Florida. And the question of cocaine, which I found some very interesting evidence that cocaine before the early 80s had been seen as a glamorous party drug, after 83, 84 is, is seen in the press, in the New York Times, and in many magazines in the United States as a danger and as a threat to the nation. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the trope that I find most interesting and most compelling coming out of this, the trope of the drug kingpin. Charles Ramirez's, Ber Charles Ramirez Berg's now classic study of the Latino image in film identifies six key Latino and Latina stereotypes that are woven throughout the entire length of film history. I'm teaching Latinos in American film uh, next semester. For those students in the room, you are eligible to uh, ex examine this with me. This is one of the texts. He identifies six key tropes and stereotypes associated with Latinos and Latinas. The bandito, the harlot, the buffoon, the Latin lover, and the dark lady. Many of these stereotypes are familiar already to you as a consumer of popular culture. I want to add that something's missing, and I want to add to his very important list something that has been overlooked but that I see as the most important of all, namely the drug kingpin as a trope in American culture. I want to work toward a theory of the Latino and Latina kingpin and ask what the trope reveals, not only about Latinos in the United States, but what does the fact that we keep circulating this image of the Latino kingpin reveal about us and our bigger society? What do they reveal about the society that produces this image? The kingpin is everywhere in narco media, of course, both in the United States and in Latin America, which I'll get to a little bit later. And, but if I had to distill how the kingpin makes meaning, I would say that one particular word marks the kingpin and the things associated with the kingpin, and that word is excess. Different media makers have attempted to twist the kingpin. Here you get Tuco Salamanca from Breaking Bad. This is Salma Hayek uh, uh, in the 2012 uh, film Savages. But excess is always a marker of the kingpin character. Everything about the kingpin is excessive. His or her taste in clothes and cars, his or her appetite for sex and money, and importantly, his or her performance of racial, gender, and ethnic affiliations, always excessive. The kingpin represents a certain type of excessive Latino, but he or she is also has a, what we call in cultural studies a metonymical relationship with Latinidad in general because this particular type of mode of representation, I would argue, has come to represent all of Latinos and Latinidad in the American imagination. So, with all of that said, as a long but I think important introduction, I want to turn to a couple of texts that remain and that w in which I see the trope of the kingpin circulating in American culture and uh, Latin American culture. So let's look first at this text. Any Narcos fans in the room? I, w I want to see your hands. Okay, I'd say about a third of you are Narcos fans. I'm a bit of a Narcos fan. For the uninitiated, however, Narcos is a Netflix series focused on DEA efforts in Colombia in the late 80s and early 1990s, specifically focused on US and Colombian joint efforts to take down the ultimate kingpin, Pablo Escobar. Here's his famous, no, infamous mugshot. Escobar is, of course, a real historical figure, but he's also a character that's all over narco media. Although it's that characterization that, in, that interests me, his image in US and Colombian pop culture in particular, it makes sense to remind you a few facts about the real Pablo Escobar. 
Escobar was a key figure in the Medellin cartel that was the largest supplier of cocaine to the United States all throughout the late 80s and early 1990s. Escobar himself headed a cartel that supplied an estimated 80%, that's 80% of the cocaine to the US market at its height. But the early 1990s, his net worth was what? I'm gonna make you guess. What do you think his net worth was in, the, in, the, er, in 1990? Ramana, can you guess? I'm awful at this. So, who, who can help her out? Who can guess? 800 million. 800 million? $1 billion. $1 His estimated net worth in 1990 is 30 billion, with a B, dollars. One person. $30 billion. So this is the magnitude of the kingpin that we're talking about. This makes him, according to many critics, the wealthiest criminal in world history. I'm interested in Escobar's image in the United States for several reasons. I should name those. He is, of course, not only a US, Lat he's not a US Latino himself. So I'm not in saying that he's Latino, a US Latino. But what fascinates me is how neatly representations of Escobar fit with the kingpin tropes that flow from Scarface to what we're now calling the golden age of television. What I want to stress is the fungibility of the kingpin trope, the flexibility, the fact that an image like Escobar is able to be applied in so many different kind of areas of popular culture. It's portable and translatable to other national settings. U.S. popular culture both produces the kingpin and also interprets, adapts, and translate the, translates the kingpin trope where he or she is found in other contexts. This is all complicated by the fact that Escobar was a very real and exceedingly well-documented person. Escobar himself loved the camera, so a lot of the footage that's in Narcos of Pablo Escobar, like riding motorcycles or like you know looking at the hippos that he had shipped from, I think the San Diego Zoo to Colombia, uh, he was that rich. Uh, he was like hippo rich. Uh, the, like a lot of that footage is actual archival footage, which I'll talk about in a minute, because Escobar himself loved being photographed and videotaped. So now. Back to Narcos, two seasons long with two more promised by Netflix. So there's more Narcos coming to your television, I promise. Narcos unfolds from the perspective of a white American DE agent relocated to Medellin. I'll talk about that a little bit, but I want to introduce you to Narcos by showing a clip that I think illustrates why my friend Sandra insists that the series has a distinctly gringo view of Colombian history. In this scene, Escobar in his, it is in his late 20s and is at the height of his power. He's been elected to Congress. And as one does when elected to Congress, he goes to an open field and smokes a joint to reflect on his journey. <laughs> so I'm sorry that what you're about to hear is a bit clipped. So the, I don't, I, the, the, the text, that the film I have is a little cut off. So I'm going to start by giving you this is the actual lines that Boyd Holbrook as Steve Murphy is saying as the clip begins. So he says, imagine you were born in a poor family, in a poor city, in a poor country. And then the clip will do some of the speaking for itself. Fascinating for a number of reasons. I really think this is a moment in which the show itself is revealing how sort of North American its audience is. I see some students from the Intro to American Studies course here. Thank you for coming. Nice to see you. Uh, I will point out that in the Intro to American Studies, of course, a key concept that we work with again and again is the so-called American dream. So here, I think you see Pablo Escobar as a poor boy from a poor family just looking out to live the American dream, a very gringo point of view about the world's most notorious kingpin. I, was watching this alongside, not actually with, but a senior colleague of mine uh, and I were watching this. And right after this scene, he goes into Congress. So he's a drug lord, gets elected to Congress. He goes into Congress, and uh, the other Congress persons are not having it. Like they walk out, they sort of shame him and force him to walk out. And she had said to me, Isn't it so sad how mean they were to P Pablo? Like he wanted to serve this country. Like, and they were mean to him. They wouldn't speak to him, and they walked out. And to me, uh, it was kind of funny because he had already murdered a lot of people by this point in the, in the show, but it was also very revealing of the show's point of view. The show had tugged at her heartstrings to kind of show Pablo Escobar as this Horatio Alger story of a boy with a dream who has a hard time achieving uh, his American dream. 
By now, it might be logical to ask where Narcos fits in with the body of work that I'm calling Narcomedia. For, for me, Narcos reveals more about the US and its point of view than it does about Latin America or Colombia. There's been a lot of internet chatter about the show, its casting choices, and how, whether or not it's good for Colombia's national image. I actually want to say that like, those debates don't even appeal to me. I'm not about looking for like, positive or authentic or real representations of history. I don't think that's possible, and I don't think that it is a filmmaker or a television showrunner's responsibility to tell the historical truth. That gets me to trouble sometimes, but um, I don't think their job is to be positive about Colombian history. Instead, what I want to do is make two main points about how I interpret the show. And this will be sort of the, the conclusion of my talk. So my first is that, my first point about how I want to interpret Narcos is that about the intertextuality of this show with another show that predated it by a few years. I insist that Narcos owes an unspoken debt of gratitude to another show titled Pablo Escobar, El Patron del Mal, or sort of like The Lord of Evil, a telenovela that aired on Colombian television in 2012 and created quite a national sensation. It was, like I said, a national sensation when it aired over the course of 113 episodes. That's 113 hours of my life devoted to watching it, from May to November of that year in 2012. So although Patron del Mal is told from a distinctly different point of view, namely the point of view of the journalistic community in Colombia, it does share some important textual and narratological points of intersection that I want to talk about. So for example, El Patron del Mal, the soap opera, uses historical footage in a way that's very clearly echoed by Narcos. Both texts use archival footage in their interstitial moments in an editing choice that I read of something as a truth claim. I'm actually going to show you a couple minutes of El Patron del Mal, and I want you to think about the relationship between his history, telling the truth, representations on television, because I think that even in this couple of minutes, a lot of this kind of stuff is happening that opens up some important intellectual terrain. El Patron del Mal, the, the, the soap opera from Colombia, I th view as a, seeing itself as a witness to history. Importantly, El Patron del Mal says pretty accurate in its depiction of history, whereas Narcos makes very liberal use of the phrase artistic license by wildly deviating from the historical record. I have tried to find historical errors in El Patron del Mal. They're very hard to find. But this, however, does not mean that we should embrace it as historical truth, but that we should interrogate those meanings of representing history on television. So I'm going to illustrate this practice with a few minutes that appear at the very beginning of the novella. So I talked about the, the scene from Narcos as Escobar at the height of his power. He's the, one of the richest people in the world, and he's elected to Congress. What you're going to see is the very start of El Patron del Mal, and it's, he's at the opposite. It, it actually starts at the end to tell the story from the beginning, a great sort of te televisual technique when you have a long story to tell. So at this point, Escobar is hunted. This actually takes place on December 2nd, 1993, one of the most important days in recent Colombian history and America's war on drugs. Anyone know why? It's the last day of Escobar's life, which is marked I think in the war on drugs and in Colombia as a very important date. Here is the sort of um, a, the title card, uh, El Patron del Mal, a much more convincing and somewhat comical Escobar, I think. But here's the first two minutes of the entire 113 hours. The reason why I let that go so long is because I wanted you to see that uh, footage of the, the aftermath of an Avianca flight, uh, airline flight in 1989, in which Pablo Escobar personally ordered the bombing, and it killed 111 civilians on that flight. Some very sad and pretty recent Colombian history. When I first watched El Patron del Mal, I thought, this show is making horrible televisual choices because it's cutting archival footage with, his, with the television show itself, the sort of diegetic world of the television series. So you'll see footage of a speech, and if you know the history, you'll know that like the, the candidate, or if you get the sense of the tone of the show, you'll see that the candidate's about to get murdered. So it'll show the actual candidate giving the actual speech, and then it'll show you the actor who's like in a somewhat bad telenovela, you know, fake mustache and wig. And I thought it was a horrible choice, but the more I watched the show, I realized it's the perfect choice 
for a show that's so deeply invested in telling the truth about history. Not that you can ever tell the truth about history, but as you might have noticed, it's told distinctly from the point of view of several of the, the children and grandchildren of journalists who were murdered by Pablo Escobar. They actually serve as the executive producers of the show, so you could, it's not, it makes no secret of its point of view. If you watched Narcos, then you know that the second season ends with a strikingly similar scene to this one at the very end. Escobar's hunted, he's in a safe house, it's not so safe. He's making phone calls, he's threatening everybody. Although that scene in Narcos is not spliced with archival footage as this one is, it closely follows it in tone, style, and dialogue. What is interesting to me, to me here is not a claim that like Narco stole the idea of El Patron del Mal. I do think that they're referencing El Patron del Mal, but I'm not interested in, in, in argument about uh, plagiarism. What I'm really interested in is a question about the politics of translation. What does it mean to take a show that airs in Colombia and translate it for American gringo audiences several years later? Um, for example, we've seen this before. Uh, this is Metastasis, which is the Colombian interpretation of another US show. Anybody know? Breaking, Breaking Bad. Strikingly similar. <laughs> There's a moment in the very first episode of Metastasis in which one of the characters says to another character, meth, what's meth? Because they're dealing, they're making and selling meth. And she says, oh, it's, it's an American drug. We like, to, we like to steal everything from the Americans, wink, wink. You know, she's making fun of the intertextuality of the shows, the fact that Metastasis is actually a very loyal remake of Breaking Bad, which is very unlike Narcos. My point is that these media forms focus on production and consumption of illegal narcotics are circulating across national and linguistic borders in entirely new ways. And I think that this is really facilitated by the fact that television as a medium is changing so dramatically. Very few people watch broadcast television anymore, as um, Chris Becker, who spoke here a couple of weeks ago or a couple of games ago, uh, might have attested. But most people are watching television, what used to be called television, there's not a great word for it now, streaming d material, uh, and it's very, uh, it flows across international borders much easier than television used to do. So what's interesting to me is to consider this. El Patron del Mal aired on Colombian television and is now available on Netflix worldwide, including in the United States. It, if you buy my argument, inspires a show called Narcos that is packaged for English speakers on Netflix, but then very recently is repackaged for Spanish speakers on Univision. You could have knocked me over with a feather when I saw uh, Narcos airing in, on Univision a uh, uh, couple of weeks ago, but it had, uh, it was very interesting because they, what they did is just flip the subtitle. So instead, instead of subtitling the Spanish with English, it subtitles the English with Spanish. That is airing on a Spanish language network based in New York with the subtitles switched. So this is pretty complicated stuff to try to trace the way that these narratives are flowing across lines and being interpreted and reinterpreted for different linguistic audiences. But it's also a pretty good metaphor for the flows, the transnational flows of narcomedia. So as I intimated before, I'm gonna get to, I'm, excuse me, I'll get to my second point about why I think Narcos is so interesting to study. As I intimated before, Escobar is the ultimate kingpin in Latin American history. No, probably in world history. And in fact, there's currently a glut of TV and movie production focused on Medellin, as the City Film Commission has begun to reconcile with the fact that producers from all over the world, but especially the United States, uh, are interested in the heyday of the Colombian cartels as, insp as inspiration for their media products. So you heard it here first, people, I promise you. Narcos is just the first of many pop culture expressions that we're about to see set in, in Escobar's Colombia. I can also promise that there will soon be a few representations of El Chapo, the Mexican drug lord, because he caused such a, Sean Penn caused such a sensation when he interviewed him in the Mexican jungle over the summer, or, or last winter. Uh, and there's currently several films uh, shooting in Medellin starring people like Javier Bardem, Penelope Cruz, and Tom Cruise. So my second main argument is this. It's that Narcos and its relatives in the world of popular culture open up a new cultural space for thinking about the kingpin trope, which leads to a question that is at the heart of much of the public discourse of the show. 
Does a series like Narcos run the risk of glamorizing and hero heroifying the kingpin, even one as devastating and destructive as Escobar? Narcos itself seems to be quite self-aware about the problem here of heroification. In season one, it deals with the trope of what we might call Saint Pablo by briefly hitting at the cult of Escobar that emerged in Medellin and beyond. This image is actually from the show, uh, reproduced uh, online that I found. And uh, it's very interesting because you see sort of a working class woman who knows too much and gets murdered by the Escobar cartel. And when, they, when the DEA goes to sort of clean up her apartment and look for clues, they find this image as sort of evidence that her devotion is ironically to Escobar, even though he's the cause of her death. So it seems to be critiquing its own potential heroification or glamorization of Escobar. But is everyone in on this critique? In Colombia and the United States, and I'd presume elsewhere, we can observe a rise in narcos-themed merchandise in the form of things like t-shirts and tote bags emblazoned with Escobar's likeness and his catchphrase, silver or lead, the choice is yours. Plot, uh, you, you get that. <laughs> Plata o plomo. There's now even a Narcos themed video game so that you can play along at home, immersing yourself in Colombia's cartel wars. Sometimes the products get even more esoteric than a video game. This is a new line of Pablo Escobar toys produced by the Bit Toy Company in conjunction with Netflix. They're cute, I guess, if you go for that kind of thing. But what does it mean to make a toy in the likeness of a person responsible for the deaths of thousands of Colombians who blew up that Avianca flight murdering 111 people in 1989, and that same year ordered more than 100 bombings throughout his home city of Medellin? Does it matter if the image replicated in a toy or video game matches with the stereotype of the Latino kingpin that has had a long-term presence in American popular culture? I don't ask this to indict just one company like the bit toy company that makes these toys, but to challenge us to consider that narco media can expose the, the atrocities of recent Colombian and US history, but can also inure us to the violence that took place in the 1980s and the 1990s. According to the Colombian magazine Semana, the Medellin cartel headed by Escobar was responsible for no fewer than 15,000 deaths over a 20 year period more than 5,500 of which took place in just four years between 1989 and 1993. So to conclude, I'm gonna take you back right to the beginning with Scarface. Just last week, Vanity Variety reported that the urtext of the genres and tropes that I've been discussing here to this afternoon will get a, re a reboot. Director Anthony Fuqua, who directed The Magnificent Seven, which some of you might have seen, and I think it's just about to leave theaters, is slated to direct a reboot of Scarface that will merge elements of the 1930s and the 1980s film text. This time, however, and oh so tellingly, Scarface will be set in Los Angeles. The title character, a Mexican immigrant. Thank you. I heard this crowd likes questions, so I'm excited. I have 15 minutes to respond. Yes. Thank you, that was amazing, great. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about gender and the, sort of these images of masculinity and your great bad example really made me think about that, sort of this kind of loser guy becomes masculinized and um, I see something similar in, in this representation of Narcos, which I haven't seen. And so the connection between the American dream and making it and masculinity and the ways in which these kind of media open up the space for reclaiming that space in patriarchy, right? The linchpin and somebody who call, makes calls and gets things done within our kind of current crisis of masculinity. That is a really good question. Uh, I, tr I was very gendered in earlier in the talk about sort of the masculinity of the kingpin. By and large, I think the kingpin trope that I've been talking about 
is a masculine figure. Sometimes, such as in Breaking Bad and other texts, they, they try to twist it. They make him a gay man, or they make it a woman, as they did with Selma Hayek in Savages in 2012. But I think masculinity is all over these texts. As you might know, I've written about uh, the masculinity of Walter White in Breaking Bad, that he starts out as this wimpy character, as you're talking about, and discovers like his inner machismo. For me, in the world of Latino studies, machismo is so played out as a, as a concept and a construct. Like I'm, I'm sick of talking about it. Personally, like I think it's overplayed. A lot of scholars have done amazing work to talk about machismo as a, fi a figment of the white American imagin imagination sort of projected upon Latino masculinities. So that work is so important, and I do find inspiration. If I could talk about the, the text itself a little bit, one of the things that gets on my nerves about Narcos more than anything is uh, relates to masculinity. Uh, I think Escobar has to become a macho over the course of the series. So, um, oh no, that's in Patron del Mal, excuse me, in El Patron del Mal. It starts with like what a lot of movies do, they, they explain um, a bad guy through like daddy issues. So uh, a lot of movies are doing this right now. And so early in El Patron del Mal, uh, Pablo Escobar is like a chubby kid who gets picked on and he has to find a way to fight back and his like overbearing mother, what a surprise in, in a vision of Latino family structures, uh, the, the overbearing Latina mother like helps him become a man. And so there's masculinity all over that. But what's also very fascinating is that uh, a lot, or I won't say a lot, several known members of his cartel are gay men. And there are little glimpses of same-sex sexuality in Narcos and El Patron del Mal, but um, they're kind of suppressed. I think they're more readily apparent in El Patron del Mal. So I'm sorry I'm going all over the place, but my, my answer is, yes, I'm on the same page with you. I want to talk about masculinity in these texts, and I will be coming to your office hours to get advice about how to do so. Back there. Hi, so um, my question is, why do you think those tropes are getting played over and over again if they're really easy to kind of, um, oh, not elaborate on, but just to repeat, instead of something where Breaking Bad, uh, they start off with this kind of twist on these little um, uh, stereotypes? And why do you think that the stereotypes aren't more interesting to the public? Um, and Thank you. That's a great question. I've argued in some of my research that's published that Breaking Bad gets a lot of credit in US popular culture from critics, from viewers like me, who was a super fan, for being completely original in how it tells its story about the meth trade in New Mexico in the contemporary moment. However, I'm also intensely critical of Breaking Bad because one of the things that I find is that Breaking Bad for much of the series actually just replays and rehashes a lot of these drug tropes that are I literally, if you take intro to popular, or if you take Latinos in American film, we start in 1915 with a silent film that's 14 minutes long called Bronco Billy and the Greaser which is about um, a Mexican greaser terrorizing a white frontier community in Texas in 1915. I think Breaking Bad has a lot in common with that. There are Mexican bad guys who are terrified T terrifying, terrorizing. Uh, a lot of the ways that Walter White, the main character, achieves his masculinity is by murdering Mexicans. Not unlike they do in the 1950, 1915 film. So what I argue is that Breaking Bad looks really, really, really original but it's actually really old fashioned because it takes those same Latino stereotypes that have literally present at the very beginning of narrative film technology and it just replays them. I think something interesting happens when, are you, did you watch Breaking Bad? Yeah. When Gus Fring, I think, is a very interesting kingpin, twist on the kingpin. Um, so I would also say, so that's one answer, is that it's not as original as it looks. The next answer is that I would say, um, media makers presume that you as an audience member are very lazy. So they use a lot of textual shortcuts in order to make meaning. And one of the things that you could do is like, ha like immerse a character in a drug trade and then have a swarthy, sweaty, 
murderous Mexican like Tuco Salamanca at the beginning of Breaking Bad come, enter the scene. As soon as that scene comes in, as soon as that character comes in, you know what's about to happen because they're presuming your laziness and you and me and all of us have to not settle for that and we have to demand more complex representations, especially of people of color and other people from marginalized groups. But we cannot let them presume that we're that lazy. Do you, Sorry, go I ahead. There's another series on Netflix, and I don't remember the, uh, the title of it right now, but it tells the story of eight different um, people in their countries, and one of them is Mexican, and like the struggles that they go through. I, I haven't seen it yet, but I've, I've read reviews on it, um, and I don't know if you've watched it. Or I haven't, okay. but I... But I do have a response to one other little part of your first question, which is about like why do we return to this? I think it's really interesting that so much is happening with Columbia right now in American popular culture. Like I said, there's gonna be at least three or four movies. The Film Commission in Medellin, the city-run film commission, used to have a policy that said, if you are interested in drugs or representations of drugs, we are closed to you. You cannot film in Medellin. They have since relaxed that policy through their negotiations with the makers of Narcos. So Narcos is one of the first film or television texts to get into Medellin. One of the beautiful things about Narcos is the, the, the location shots. It's filmed all over Medellin. It has like drone shots that show you like the entire cityscape. It's beautiful. But I think that the city, and I, I plan to go and interview some people from the Film Commission of Medellin, because I think they're, they're making very interesting choices about the types of stories that they want told. But there's a lot of attention. I see a lot of popular culture looking right now at the 1990s. There's a lot of interest. There's like five shows about John JonBenet Ramsey on basic cable right now. No, literally. You know, it's because we're very interested. There, the OJ movie that, or the OJ series, what was it? The People versus OJ Simpson. It was just a huge hit for FX, I think. Like, we're really interested in the 90s, and as I'm trying to argue, a very important part of the story of the 90s is the war on drugs and its failures and the relationships between the US and Latin America throughout that period. Yeah? Would you say that the main objective of Trump was not so much to go into the world market to take that in series, but more as a to delegate Colombians into this is your history, learn it, or else you will make the same mistakes over again. I mean, every episode started with that same line. Ah, you've seen it. Yeah, it, it's, it starts with the line. Those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. I absolutely think, I think, El Patron del Mal is a pedagogical project. I think, and it has a very distinct point of view, those descendants or some of the journalists themselves who helped to expose Escobar's misdeeds to their country, and it has a very specific purpose. I, I think Narcos is trying to get a world market. El Patron del Mal, like it's, I, I'm not Colombian. It's hard to even watch and keep up with as a non-Colombian because it is so densely packed about its subject. Um, so I absolutely think it's, it's audience. However, there's a big but there. The but is that uh, it appears on US Netflix. That's how I watched it. So although I think it's Colombian made for a Colombian audience, TV doesn't work that way anymore. Media, digital media doesn't work that way anymore. So now you can make a show like that for a national audience and it's intrinsically international if Netflix will release it. I don't think you can, do you know if you could watch Narcos in Colombia? Because it's you can't watch it in Brazil. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you can watch Narcos in Colombia. Yes. Uh, two things. One, if you're exploring uh, American pop culture examinations, best part, you might want to look at uh, ESPN. Their famous 30 for 30 documentary it had one on called "The Two Escobars" on how Pablo Escobar killed the Colombian soccer star Escobar yeah. for committing a goal against his own team. So that might be. I've heard a lot about that, and several people have suggested it. Thank you for the reminder. There's also several documentaries on Netflix right now, one of which is about the son of Pablo Escobar trying to make amends with some of the sons of the politicians he murdered. Another one is called Cocaine Cowboys, which is about DEA agents bending the law in order to, not unlike Narcos. Sorry, I cut you off. No, not at all. The second thing was, I'm wondering if you're, in your examination of it, of the... Uh, American pop culture's demonization of Latinos through uh, their pollution or corruption of American society by the trafficking of drugs. If you would, uh, if you have any thoughts about or intention to examine that there might be ambivalence within that, 
specifically within kingpins because they are doing so through the achievement, the overachievement of the American dream. <laughs> so it's not just the pollution, but they're doing it. They're beating Americans at their own game. <laughs> and then we're back to excess, as we can see in the classic American tale of Citizen Kate, who does the same thing, overshoots the mark. So I'm wondering if there's any thoughts about that. I, mean, I think so. I think some of the excess I was talking about also relates to the downfall of each of the kingpins. So if you go back to Tony Montana in Scarface, played by El Pacino, uh, he's, the, the performance itself is like legendary in Hollywood because it's so unhinged by the end. He gets coked up, he gets addicted to his own product, and what I find is that a lot of the kingpins fall that way. Escobar doesn't. Escobar is not like a big cocaine user. Uh, Walter White in Breaking Bad is not a meth user, but this part of their success is because their competitors get addicted to the product. So. A lot of these shows have a kind of cold-blooded view of the, the things that you're talking about. They sort of look at them as like economic successes. That's what, th that is some of the dark terrain that I think Breaking Bad, for example, explores again and again. Like, he, he learns how to like out maneuver everyone. He's not Latino, the main character, but like his success becomes um, a th source of like fear, terror, trauma, et cetera. Like he becomes scary to his own family, for example just like a lot of the kingpins do, who, as you put it, beat the Americans at their own game. Interesting. Yes? To what do you contribute like, popular appetite for things like these toys? And it makes me wonder about the control that the media has over our desires you know, as, as we move forward. And, uh, the, the kinds of, I mean, who's buying these and who's receiving them? That's a great question. I would say these toys, for example, these are collector's items. So these are not mass market products at all. The Narcos video game has actually not been very successful. It has horrible reviews. I've, I've watched people playing it because now people like post themselves playing video games on YouTube, which seems like the most boring thing imaginable. I watch it so you don't have to. Um, I, I, I think this stuff is pretty niche. I don't think this is mass market stuff. So I don't quite know. I think the audience, I can sum up in a word, fans. Fans of the show are going to be the ones probably who are drawn to Narcos, the video game, and especially the bit toys. These toys are quite expensive. You know, they're 80 bucks or something. So you're, you're not going to you know, sell that at your local Target. I want to say, can I, you look like you want me to finish, but I, <laughs> okay, okay. I want to say one thing uh, that I skipped over in my talk, and it's that these, you mentioned the appetite for these kinds of texts. I think one of the things that, one of the ways in which these texts fail that we have to hold them accountable to as consumers of the text is that there's very little interest about the cocaine market in the United States. The United, like, Colombian politics of the 80s and 90s would not exist, or Panama, or Nicaragua, or El Salvador, without a massive billion and billion of dollars worth market for, for Colombian cocaine in the United States. There's only one little scene, and if you're a Narcos fan, you might have m noticed it. There's one scene in which Steve Murphy, the blonde DEA agent, his wife leaves because she says, I'm out of here, Colombia's too dangerous. They killed the cat, literally. Um, so he goes to an airport to chase her down, and he sees two white Americans uh, trading cocaine, so like the, a, a drug trade, and uh, he beats them up. And he's like, you're a part of the problem. It's about 90 seconds of the show, which is about 25 hours long. It pays very little attention. And I think that is one of the things that, that like when I talk about where I need to take this, this research next, I have to get into questions about the market, about why we're so interested in vilifying Latinos in this way, but we don't really have not focused on the market for cocaine. The reason why America's war on drug fails is because it's focused so heavily on the production end. Nancy Reagan's campaign does not have any, or the US federal policy, I should say, not to vilify one person, does not have treatment very extensively written into the plan of its war on drugs. It only has things like uh, herbicide in the fields of Colombia, the already poor fields of Colombia, written into the process, or, or, arming, or arming guerrilla groups in Colombia and parts of Central America. It doesn't have drug treatment written into it, which is why it fails. It's very interesting to me that these shows have the exact same ideological problem. They, they focus extensively on production. They're very narrowly interested in uh, the market, in the use of drugs. 
I would say if you want to see one film that I think is an antidote for this, I would say in the year 2000, Steven Soderbergh made a film called Traffic, which has a lot of problems. But one of its successes is looking at the market of a sub suburban white kids, for example, serving as the largest market for cocaine. Um, that's one sort of way to get around <coughs> these representational problems. Do I still get the one question, or do we have to go? One. I'll make it quick. Oh, they want to go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.